you haven't found a seat, please find one. There's more seats coming if we need them, so welcome. I am Luis Alvarez. I'm the director of the Institute of Arts and Humanities here at UCSD. And thanks so much for joining us this afternoon, especially after what has been a couple of particularly chilly, wet, and windy days uh, for San Diego. <laughs> As our visitor will attest, chilly? What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, we are here this afternoon for universities, how higher education is transforming urban America with Professor DeVerry and Baldwin. Before we introduce our speaker, I do want to take just a quick minute, maybe two minutes or so, to tell you a little bit about the Institute's flagship series that today's event is a part of, Challenging Conversations. The series aims to bring smart, dynamic folks to campus to engage in big, important discussions about who we are, the kind of society we live in, and how we all share in the struggle to make our communities better. Challenging Conversations brings difficult topics and questions to the table for all of us to discuss in generative, even disorienting ways. We hope it encourages listening to voices and experiences other than our own, pushes us to interrogate how and with whom we think and speak as much as what we think and speak, and be inspired how lots of folks stand up, speak truth to power, and do the right things for the right reasons. This afternoon's event falls right in line. A quick word about the extraordinary exhibit all around us. Reclaim, Remain, Rebuild, Posters on Affordable Housing, Gentrification and Resistance is on loan from the Center for the Study of Political Graphics in Los Angeles. The center is an amazing archive, social justice organization, and research site all rolled into one. It's home to thousands, literally thousands, of political posters from the last century. We're fortunate to have the exhibit with us here at UCSD for the rest of the quarter, and I encourage you to come back again before it leaves. And if you teach classes or sections and want to hold a session in this space, we can accommodate that as well. Yesterday, I had my history of race, riots, and violence in the US class meet in this uh, space, and it was really fantastic for me as the professor and for all of the students, I think, many of whom I see here, at least a few of you. Thanks for coming. Uh, special thanks to the amazing curatorial advisors for this exhibit, Noni Brindelson and Erica Barbosa and Farshid Bazmandegan from the Arts and Community Engagement Program for their creativity and brilliance in bringing the exhibit to life. And to the amazing team of Professor Nancy Kwok, Professor Jessica Graham, Joelle Fusaro and Catherine Levy and many others for making this happen. Last but not least, thanks to all of our many sponsors. IAH, the Mellon Foundation Sawyer Seminar, the Black Studies Project, the International Institute, and History Department, all here from UCSD, as well as the University of California Office of the President. With that, please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Jessica Graham, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Luis, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm so glad that the weather decided to behave and be a little bit more San Diego-like for our guest. Um, I told him, I said, like, I swear that's really as bad as it gets. Poor guy was literally arriving during a torrential downpour. So I'm um, glad we can show him both the, both the best of the beauty of San Diego, but also the intellectual community that we have here. We already had a wonderful brown bag with Tavarian this afternoon with the title uh, Black Knowledge and the Future of Urban Studies. And it was a really wonderful, energetic, lively conversation. So he gave us some teasers about the talk today that we're looking forward to. So Professor Devarian De Baldwin is the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College. He is author of uh, Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity and the Great Migration and Black Urban Life that was published by UNC Press in 2007 and co-editor with Minka Makalani of the essay collection Escape from New York, The New Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. Baldwin is currently uh, at work on two new uh, single authored projects, Land of Darkness, Chicago and the Making of Race in Modern America, which will be published by Oxford University Press. And the second book will be In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Higher Education is Transforming Urban America, which obviously um, the talk today will be uh, derived from. 
In addition to teaching and writing, Baldwin sits on the Executive Council of the Society for Historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. He serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Urban History, the Journal of African American History, and the American Studies Journal. Baldwin is also co-editor of the Urban Life, Landscape, and Policy Book Series for Temple University Press and was appointed a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Um, he's way too young to have all these accolades. Um, we're, we're happy to have you here and um, we're happy to see you all. And please join me in welcoming Professor Baldwin. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Yes, it's, uh, it might be overcast out there, but it can be sunny in here. Right? <laughs> um, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, it's been a long time since I've been to San Diego, and um, I'm just looking forward to a great conversation. I, uh, first of all, Jessica and I go back. Uh, we were both uh, uh, awardees of a, a very important um, dissertation fellowship for um, African Americans, well, for, actually for scholars of color at Notre Dame University some years ago, which is now defunct, um, which that makes no sense, but there it is. Um, I also want to thank Luis Alvarez um, for, um, for this Arts and Institute Institute. We talked for a long time about trying to engage the community, to bring the community here. Um, different ways of doing academic work in ways that are inspiring, provoking. Um, and so I really appreciate that conversation and what you're doing. Um, isn't it great to be in this space? This is an amazing exhibit and uh, very timely. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful. And I also want to thank Nancy Quad, um, my good colleague, my urban studies comrade and friend um, for making this possible as well. So it's really a pleasure in so many ways um, to be here. Um, you guys ready? Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> so the title of my talk this afternoon, um, oops, is Universities, Higher Education, and the Transformation of Urban America. I'm actually going to take this off. So, in Los Angeles, the University of Southern California is the largest private sector employer in the county. Columbia University and New York University are the second and third largest landowners on the island of Manhattan, only behind the Catholic Church. And the University of Chicago fields one of the largest private security forces in the country with jurisdiction over 65,000 non-student residents on Chicago's south side. So colleges, universities, and their affiliated medical centers, what we've shorthanded as the meds and eds, have emerged as the dominant employers, real estate holders, policing agents, and healthcare providers in major metropolitan areas across the continent. This growing relationship between higher education and urban development has given rise to what I am calling universities. This is a concept that highlights the inflated role institutions of higher education are playing in the urban planning and economic development of U.S. cities. So in short, the quaint notion of the ivory tower is dead as city schools increase their control over surrounding neighborhoods to help shore up their fiscal stability and cultural authority in times of socioeconomic change. But how did we get here? How did these universe cities come to take on such a predominant and powerful role in the governance and the development of our urban landscapes? Well, the enlarged influence of meds and eds over city life dates at least to the end of World War II. My good uh, colleague and friend, Craig Wilder, would say it goes back to slavery. Um, but I would say that for this conversation, it at least goes back to World War II. Uh, many of us are familiar with schools like Stanford, MIT, and U Chicago, um, and how they provided research for military purposes. In 1967, Senator uh, J. William Fulbright rallied against what he originally called the military, industrial, complex. academic complex. Ah. <laughs> the military, industrial, academic complex. 
Um, but at the same time, uh, and this was going on with the military development at universities, a group of urban universities were lobbying and lobbied for federal housing legislation in 1959 that helped make higher education the friendly face of urban renewal projects across the country. These efforts demolished black and brown neighborhoods and established white residential or institutional islands around urban campuses. In 1967, the University of Pennsylvania used this legislation for 59 to start displacing approximately 600 low-income and African-American families and build its university city, Science Center, the nation's first inner-city urban research park. And then just last year marked the 50th anniversary of what has been, what has been called Columbia 68. It was only after protests against what residents and students were calling Jim Crow that Columbia University backed off its 1968 plan to build a gymnasium in a, the public Morningside Park that would have created a physical barrier between the uh, majority white school at the top, Columbia here, and the predominantly black Harlem down below with, you know, adequately called university and community entrances and all the implications that came with that. But while we had these kinds of fortifications and embankments, universities creating kind of institutional walls, uh, today higher education's ties of influence have shifted from schools separating themselves from surrounding cities to actually spreading far beyond the campus where urban colleges and universities are taking stewardship over entire neighborhoods that surround their campus. So here is Jim Crow, Columbia in 1968, and here are NYU on the left and Columbia's expansion plans in the present. So here we have the main NYU campus in Washington Square Park, and then we have the health corridor on uh, 35th, 33rd, the downtown Brooklyn campus, and the now defunct Governor's Island campus, but then we have NYU Abu Dhabi and NYU Shanghai uh, that help underwrite the developments here. And then Columbia, we have the main campus here extending all the way up to 135th Street. So it is skipping over Inwood and going into Hamilton Heights in the 160s. So again, we see an important shift from campus fortification to stewardship over neighborhoods beyond the campus. So what happened? Why this shift in development priorities on the part of universities? So after decades of economic divestment and white population flight, young professionals and empty nesters, retirees, etc., began seeking an urban lifestyle in the 1990s, wanting to come back into the city, the, the, what people had called the uh, back to the city movement, um, after being disaffected, dis disinterested in the homogeneity of suburban sprawl. So, and it was precisely the commercial amenities associated with university life, concerts, coffee shops, foot traffic congestion, fully wired networking, um, it was these elements, these amenities, that were marked as a desirable urban experience. So in many regards, when suburbanites are coming back into the city, the, their imagining of city life was in fact campus life. So cities began to compete with each other for the tax revenues that these new urbanites would provide. So you got cities competing with each other for the tax benefits of these empty nesters and young professionals coming back to the city. So again, uh, and so then when the decline in manufacturing in the 80s and 90s and earlier, the bell towers of higher education were targeted as the new smokestacks, the signals of a thriving economy. So that's on one side, the city competition for the tax base of incoming urbanites. On the other hand, colleges and universities 
face shrinking state expenditures for higher education. So whether it's a public university uh, like UCSD or a private university like Harvard, they all get state money. But by the 90s, you saw those budgets, those earmarks shrinking. So by extending their footprint into surrounding neighborhoods through land ownership, employment, and policing, schools are now able to generate new sources of revenue while also providing the urban amenities desired by students, research scholars, and their families. So the interest of municipal or city governing and urban higher education administrators have converged in the shared quest to capture the consumer dollars of empty nesters, young professionals, tourists, faculty, students, and their families desiring a new urban lifestyle after decades of urban divestment. In the process, higher education has been given the green light to redesign urban neighborhoods into the lucrative model of the university campus. So now, everyone wants to build a univer city. Locations across the country are recruiting schools to their cities to build a campus in their cities to attract these various economic and social benefits. In 2011, former Mayor Bloomberg of New York City held an Applied Science International competition offering over $100 million in public inducements to lure the winning partnership between Cornell University and Technicon Israel Institute of Technology to New York City on Roosevelt Island in order to create a biotech hub to compete with San Francisco and Boston. Many, like scholar Richard Florida, celebrate that colleges and universities have the capacity to spark neighborhood vitality that can attract the vaunted creative class. Have we heard that phrase before? This is the, this is the architect of that. He would get, uh, uh, what was it, $50,000 consultant fees to go all over the country to uh, consult cities on how to attract the creative class. Um, and one of the main planks in this vision was build a, a campus, right? Or some version of a campus. So the point here is that we, this dynamic uh, would create the space and the environment to create and attract this vaunted creative class by providing museums and lectures and public safety protections while also creating the new economic opportunities in biotech, tourism, and startups. So for example, uh, in, uh, this is the Pittsburgh Technology Center. About 15 years ago, the partnership between the city of Pittsburgh, uh, the University of Pittsburgh, and Carnegie Mellon came together and they transformed an abandoned steel mill on a brownfield into research and tech spaces. So, a good. Um, St. Louis University. They created, for example, a mortgage program for all employees to live in what had historically been a depressed area um, called Midtown Alley. They also created on the right um, Hotel Ignacio, a multi-million dollar reuse project in Midtown. So these are just a couple of examples of what could and was being done in the name of anchoring urban development through the venue and the, and the uh, kind of the, um, the space of the universe, what university could do. Uh, but despite all of the bold claims about higher education's expansive reach across American cities, communities of color that surround campuses are left especially vulnerable. These neighboring communities of color and working class neighborhoods frequently sit in the spaces outside of the campus. And these spaces, because of their presence, have become zones of relatively cheap land while holding little political influence. The residents in these, because of the history of race and land valuation, which you all know very well, has made this, the, the, the value of this land relatively cheap for big universities. 
is easy to buy up. On top of that, because of a history of racism and political power, these communities have uh, less access to political authority to push back against these kinds of developments. So this makes these neighborhoods that surround campuses the primary and most lucrative sites for university expansion first before universities go beyond their immediate neighborhoods to make the campus model a blueprint for urban development in cities across their, their region. So all of this is due to a longer history of higher education's control over these very same neighborhoods in which they specifically sit. So if you recall the older history of Columbia University in Harlem and the case of Jim Crow with that building in the middle of Morningside Park that never was completed because of protest, that internal approach. Flash forward to 2003 and on the right hand corner here you have um, the announced plan to build a new tech campus and that's in West Harlem. So that was the original space of what it looked like. And that was the targeted site for building um, this biotech campus. So students and residents, however, so there was this announcement in 2003 that they're going to build this campus. And the president, Lee Bolton, said, we get it. We've had this terse relationship with Harlem. We're going to do better. That was a statement in 2003. Okay, one year later, students and residents soon discovered, however, that Columbia had started working with city administrators to manufacture a neighborhood conditions report. Hmm. This report labeled the West Harlem, Manhattanville area, for you urban historians, they, they, this report allowed them to name the area blighted. And so, this designation of being blighted justified the use of eminent domain to begin the forced acquisition and demolition of all but three properties on this 16 acres of the neighborhood for what is now being built as a $6 billion research campus. So that was in 2004. In 2009, a state appeals court described that blight designation as quote unquote Mere sophistry, made up, magic, abhorrent. That was in 2009. But a year later, a higher court upheld Columbia's use of eminent domain and the West Harlem campus forges ahead in the present. At the same time, USC has just opened its USC Village, which has been described at a space where Disneyland and Hogwarts meet. <laughs> so just, I'll let you take that in for a minute. But, um, <laughs> but as USC pushed ahead to replace its ancient university village with this $900 million complex of stores and dormitories, Residents in the surrounding neighborhoods of USC, South Central, watched landlords scramble to convert what had once been family-friendly dwellings into what? Student-oriented rentals, with rates increased by as much as 50%. So while the development, the housing development's going on, Many of the same residents displaced by these campus expansions come back only in the form of low wage sectors of what I'm calling ivory tower labor. Um, janitors, cooks, groundskeepers, and other kinds of support staff. So for example, this is, this is an image of Harvard University. Um, and so Harvard has continued to wield its 38 billion, not million, $38 billion endowment to continue rapid expansion from their main campus across the, trial, across the river into what has historically been a working class neighborhood called Austin Brighton. You can already see here um, the sports fields. Then here are uh, science and tech research labs. 
that give way to startup companies. So they're wielding their $36 billion endowment to expand into Austin Brighton, while in 2016, their food service workers went on strike to protest low wages and rising health care costs. So these things are happening simultaneously. Multi-million and billion dollar expansion and the taking away of benefits for low wage ivory tower labor. So you have housing, you have labor, and then as these schools embark on major upgrades and exploitive labor practices, they, the black and brown students, workers, and residents that come near the campus face increased police scrutiny. At first, South Side Chicagoans welcomed the University of Chicago Police Department into their embattled neighborhoods. We've heard on TV about the struggles around the violence in uh, black and brown communities in Chicago. So in the face of that, um, neighborhoods welcomed UCPD into their neighborhoods. But recent data reveals a stark racial disparity in policing, where African Americans make up approximately 59% of the population under UCPD jurisdiction, but make up 93% of UCPD's investigation stops. Residents are also frustrated by what is being called by residents a two-tiered system of policing. What is that? This is a policing system where a student and a community member are accused of the same crime or infraction, but the student meets with who? The dean of students. And the resident ends up in the criminal justice system. So in this phenomenon, you have the expansion of university police that are getting trained by state policing guidelines to have jurisdiction beyond the campus, to act as an extension of city police, but with competing interests. Is their job to protect and serve in the name of the community interest or to police in a way that protects the brand of the university? So in the case, if there is a, say, a student organization or a fraternity sorority that is disturbing the police and the police come, do they arrest or do they give them multiple warnings to calm down so that there isn't uh, a bad reputation for the university? So this is real when it comes to issues of when you hand over universities or cities to university jurisdictions in policing, in housing, in governance, what interests determine and shape how they engage with the communities that they're policing and engaging and stewarding over? This is the real issue. So I believe that we remain blind to these kinds of activities largely because of the assumption that higher education is still inherently a what? A public good, higher education. And this public good designation is uh, most clearly marked in the United States by the tax-exempt status afforded colleges and universities for providing services that would otherwise come from the government. So the public good designation, the, the nonprofit designation comes, or public good status comes, because the belief is that, well, higher education is doing something that would otherwise have to be done by the city or by the state. So in exchange for that, we provide tax exemption. But I argue we must take note of what I'm calling the public good paradox. Within this paradox, higher education's tax exempt status as a nonprofit is precisely what helps city schools generate significant private profits and influence with little public oversight. So city colleges and universities pay virtually no taxes on their expanding campuses. They also reap the benefits of police and fire protections. Snow and trash removal, I mean, not snow for you guys, but for me. <laughs> snow and trash removal, uh, road maintenance, and other services while shouldering little of the financial burden for these services. The burden has been passed on to who? 
can pass on to local homeowners, small business owners, and through the form of inflated rental costs. Such unfair taxing rates cause residents in the historically black neighborhood of Witherspoon Jackson here um, to sue and win an $18 million settlement from Princeton University in 2016. Why? Because residents argued that while local property taxes had increased on their properties, the university maintained its exemption for buildings where research was going on that was generating millions of dollars in commercial royalties. So the point here is that donor gifts to endowments are tax deductible. The investment income earned by endowments is tax free. And so higher education has a competitive edge over businesses that pay taxes in say biotech or property management. So if you're in those areas, what are you inclined to do? Partner with a university where it can provide tax, a tax shelter for your work while not contributing to the public good through paying taxes for public services that you benefit from. So one plaintiff in the Princeton case described Princeton as a hedge fund that conducts classes. So, so ultimately, we can no longer evaluate colleges and universities by their, simply by their stated aim of providing knowledge. They also oversee a vast payroll of white collar and low wage contingent workers. They maintain cheap workshops where graduate students secure lucrative patents for corporate research. Campuses expand across cities, often choosing to bank land, awaiting its appreciation and selling it, rather than investing in services and infrastructure that would aid the local community. But this new urban arrangement is not a natural outcome of the natural laws of the market. Higher education is a key growth machine in today's cities because it has been given the keys to drive the urban economy forward. Urban development is being publicly funded to serve the economic growth desires of higher education as much or more as their educational interests. Some could say, how ironic or hypocritical that you, a professor that benefits from higher education, is leveling such a critique. But I offer the humble but firm reply that it is precisely my love for higher education from the inside that compels me to push this conversation forward. I want higher education to live up to its public good mandate as it impacts the world beyond its walls. We often see caricatures of colleges and universities as ivory tower bastions for tenured radicals and young snowflakes out of touch with reality. But higher education's footprint across the nation's cities tells a much different story. Universities set themselves the task of solving the most difficult problems facing humanity, and yet they have failed to question their own impact right outside the campus gates. Yet, there is hope for a better ending to this story. In 2012, the college-heavy city of Boston, Massachusetts, asked nonprofits with more than $15 million in tax-exempt property to volunteer just 25% of their property taxes. This is called a pilot, payment in lieu of taxes. And you're seeing these arrangements all over the country. So Boston just simply asked if their colleges and universities that blanket their city would provide just 25% of what they would normally have to provide if they were not a university in taxes. Um, 
though this is difficult because the law says that nonprofits don't have to. So these arrangements are still what? Voluntary. And so for example, schools like Harvard, Boston University, Boston College, Northeastern, those that do provide something, they provide it when they want to and how they want to. And hence they still have no actual um, uh, requirement to answer to the public good. So they are engaging and, and accumulating wealth in the name of serving the public good in ways that have little public oversight or public scrutiny. But this pilot program and its expansion across the country is an avenue where change is slowly being made. So for example, Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island, agreed with uh, struggling Providence to engage in a firm pilot, a long-standing pilot that they will offer every year because the city is, was near bankruptcy. At the same time, all across the country, you have, students have been joining university workers in demanding living wages and campaigns. They have aligned with neighborhoods, as we see around here, to fight gentrification, what I call displacement, and uh, um, to, at, at the hands of the university. And ever since 2013, um, Chicago's campaign for equitable policing has been fighting to ensure just treatment and an end to racial profiling within the expanding jurisdiction of the University of Chicago's police department. Finally, a great example is happening in all places, Winnipeg, Ontario. It's always Canada, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was actually giving a lecture like this at, in Winnipeg. And I was talking really against the limitations of university expansion. And a, a gentleman came up to me and said, um, have you been here before? Do you know what we're doing? And so that visit changed my life in powerful ways. And it was probably because when I give lectures like this, and university administrators come and say, well, OK, critique, critique, critique. And of course, the way to shut down that critique is, well, what are your solutions? Right? Are you just a critic or are you a builder? And so wonderfully through Winnipeg, I can say, well, actually, in fact, I do. Another university is possible. So in the case of Winnipeg, uh, the University of Winnipeg builds, so for you sustainable folks, they build LEED certified mixed housing geared towards students with families, but also offers market rate units for local residents, but also earmarks affordable units for the impoverished First Nations population that surrounds the campus. So here is one of their first LEED certified developments. On the top, you have um, 150 dormitory style housing units. On the bottom, you have two and three bedroom family style housing units that are offered to anybody in the neighborhood um, that is a student and their families. Now, student doesn't mean you attend University of Winnipeg. You can be going to culinary school. You can be going to an online program. You could be doing any, you could be doing a mechanics refresher course. Any of these, any kind of dedicated student can make you eligible for, for you and your family to be located in university housing below students. I don't know if you want to be below students. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this is Winnipeg, the University of Winnipeg building this. And behind each one of their housing units are affordable daycare spaces. And then within these units, you have market rate housing for just people that want to live downtown. That pretty much underwrites the whole thing. But you also have affordable housing. So based on what the standard uh, uh, rate of housing is, a percentage of that you pay. So it can still be extremely expensive. But then below that, they have what they call rent geared to income where you only pay a percentage of your income, no matter what that is, for housing in a two or three bedroom, particularly targeted at the first nation populations that surround this campus. At the same time, the university just built a sports academic complex, and they engaged in a community benefits agreement, which is another powerful project, a community benefits agreement with the neighborhood, whereby they have 
agreed to designate so many hours a month, or actually a, a week, to community organizations to claim use and ownership over the RecPlex every week. Now, if you know anything about Winnipeg, it gets <laughs> brick cold. Like you think that 50, below 50 in Chicago was an anomaly. That's a norm in Winnipeg, right? So to have access to sports facilities for the community that's university controlled and owned is significant. But even with this amazing story here, there were some, you know, to the left that were dissatisfied with the fact that this is the campus where the university already sits. But that most of the First Nation population that moved to the city during the kind of uh, the reservation purges of the 70s, where they were, where um, First Nations populations were pushed off the res and into the city and into poverty. Most of that population lives on the north end of Winnipeg. And there, where there's rampant, there's crime, high alcoholism, drug use, violence, etc. So a couple of faculty members from the Center for Urban and Economic Studies got together and they took this space here, which was Merchant's Corner, which had been a single um, uh, residence occupancy space, an SRO, that was primarily just being used for drug use. Banded, boarded up, first floor was just simply a, a, a shoot, shooting gallery, and you know what that is, right? Um, was a shooting gallery. They um, got funds, not even from the university, because the university didn't want to help them. They were doing this. They didn't want to support this. So the faculty got together, with, got state grants, they got local uh, uh, foundation money, uh, private benefactors bought Merchant's Corner a summer of years ago and converted it and built it. Now this is what it looked like last, uh, about five months that I was there. And so this is an educational complex in the heart of the First Nations community that um, here, this is a new add-on. You see, this is it here. They're going to put feathers from the dominant First Nations um, in the area on that space. Here is the learning space. Behind it is the rent geared to income housing with the daycare. And then within the housing unit, there was a unit preserved for an elder to provide counsel and support for the residents that live in that space. So this is something that we couldn't even imagine at the current moment in US higher education. That when, it, when you talk about the university as an anchor, they really are living that. And then to add insult to injury, they had the audacity on the full campus system to fire Aramark, right? You know what Aramark is? The food service company? Like Tedesco or Marriott, they have a lock on university food services, primarily chicken nuggets and french fries, right? And bad ones at that. <laughs> so they fired Aramark about seven years ago and they created their own food service company called Diversity Foods that services the entire campus and caters to a number of industries and institutions in the community. But the important part of that, on top of that, is that 70% of the employees in Diversity Foods are what Canada has designated as hard to employ communities. So individuals from the First Nation community, recently um, uh, uh, released from incarceration community, um, refugees, single mothers, and what they call new immigrants, or new, new Canadians, which we would call immigrants. 70% of their labor force comes from those communities for diversity foods. They, we talk about farm to table, right? All the farm to table, farm to table. They receive all their food resources from, they don't go beyond a 100 kilometer radius for all of the food that they use in diversity foods. They only use compost for waste. So that so means only 2% of the waste that they create goes into a landfill. 98% of the things that they produce go into compost. And on top of that, next year, they're trying to turn diversity foods into a workers' cooperative. And this is the university food service company. Right? So affordable housing, food services, community engagement, uh, uh, community benefits agreement for shared institutional spaces. This is what's possible in the face of all the things that I've been discussing thus far. So what is the point of all this? 
why talk about universities, both the bad, the good, the ugly, and the in-between? Because a new city is emerging right before our eyes, even right outside these doors. If you look at the partnerships between this university and the development of the biotech and the biomed uh, startup uh, campuses that surround and dot and partner with this campus. Um, this new city is emerging right before our eyes. And uh, city and even growing college town campuses sit at the crossroads between their educational mandate and their economic ambitions. If colleges and universities are going to be the new company and our cities are going to become their new company towns, then campus stakeholders, neighborhood residents, and city leaders must all be at the table in an equal way because we must begin to hold transparent discussions about the impact of these universe cities, their possibilities, and their limits. Thank you. I almost forgot, Joel was kind enough to add this wonderful, uh, oh, it's not there. Well, supposed to be questions. Sorry, but I'll say it. Questions? <laughs> you want to? No, Okay, all right. Thanks so much for that brilliant talk. I'm, I'm super excited for the Q&A. If you wouldn't mind sort of restraining your question asking to a sort of a concise question, that would be helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Who would like to ask a question? Thank you for that talk, Professor Baldwin. Thank you. Um, is there any relationship between the cost of rising tuition and university expansion? Um, I think that rising, most, in the most basic way, rising tuition is um, one of the end results of the university looking for other revenue streams. I think they run in parallel. Rising tuition is running parallel with the expansion process, but one where, place where the relationship does exist is not in tuition, but room and board. So as we probably know, tuition is holding steady, but room and board costs are exploding. Why? Because of the attempt to create these, not just camp expansions, but rock climbing walls and uh, boutique food services and designer dorms as a way to attract grad students and students and their families um, to call, help offset um, university expansion. So that's the, where I found, that's the location, room and board, um, non-tuition costs, student activity fee costs. These are the, 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 the budget streams. That are being un that are helping to underwrite university expansion. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Thank you. So I'm in the urban studies and planning program here on campus, mm -hmm. and I just a quick footnote and then a question. Sure. Harvard is in a lot of trouble right now, not right. only for expanding in the way it does locally, right. but they're purchasing a lot of land in the agricultural belt in Central California mm. to claim uh, groundwater rights. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon with, okay. with this cap. Anyway. Well, tell me more later. I yeah, I'll tell you what. It. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's in the, if you Google it, it's in the news. It's okay. kind of a okay. scandalous okay. thing. Okay. There's okay. a lot of blowback among the farmers. And things. Okay. But the question is, a lot of what you described is fantastic. And I okay. love how you landed up on Winnipeg as an exemplar. One of the things that we're working on is to try to think about the campus itself as a living laboratory. Yeah and how the innovations that are happening on the campus to be zero waste, carbon neutral, water wise, right. public realm friendly. Yeah. How do you link up, and this is what I'm asking you to sort of reflect on. Sure. How do you link up an incentive structure for faculty to work with staff on the physical plant itself wow. while innovating that space and bringing it out in authentic ways to disadvantaged communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, hmm. that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, the, at, at incentivizing, I mean, well, in, in one, in certain ways, um, you can make, you can, you can dictate, not dictate, but in, insist that a lot of universities are engaged, are, are starting, the, the hip word now is community engagement. But what that means historically has been like tutoring programs, 
and things of that nature. So if, if universities, and, and they're incentivizing that. So in terms of uh, leave time, benefits, et cetera. So if we, if we target that community engagement iconography, but insert within it these more robust forms of uh, uh, active, activating and uh, uh, modeling university practices with faculty out to the campus, I think that might be one way of beginning to do that is really tackling and attacking the the the, uh, the surfaceness, the, the 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 fealty of that community engagement language, and making it more robust and real. I think that might be one way in because that's become the kind of branding watchword for campuses all over the country, and it, in most cases, it doesn't mean anything. So if we if we insert it with what you're talking about, uh, I think that works. Um, I think also, but at the state level, at the at the at the governing level, there has to be some lobbying to governance to say that in exchange for federal dollars and for municipal dollars, you have to engage in the kind of projects you're talking about in order to receive the funds. And that comes from the back end, from public lobbying uh, 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 cities and states to make that case for their governance, especially for the communities that live in the neighborhoods that surround the campus. Sure. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was great. And I really like the Tato Universities. Um, so I wanted to see what you thought about um, sort of the mirroring of our campus communities, um, the disparity between salaries between some faculty, let's say. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not yeah. talking like athletic coaches, but, right. you know, faculty who make over a million a year. Right. And then you have people who are staff who make maybe, you know, in the range of 40000 a year. Can't right. even afford to afford parking. Yeah. Um, and so you've got that big disparity between sort of for lack of a better analogy, rich and poor. Yep. Yeah. Yes, so that's right. That's so to be fair, there has been quite a bit of scholarship on, on the labor component of the story. Um, people have off, you know, offered analysis in the, under the rubric of university as corporation. So what I'm trying to do is add to that and say that while we've had this focus on the university's corporation within its gates, we really look at the impact of higher education beyond its gates. So there's lots of work on that. but. In the ways in which that work links up with my work is that I think there are ways in which you can offer, so for example, even if you can't do it in real time salaries, if you are a university buying up housing outside of your campus, offer that housing with benefits or um, subsidies for, uh, uh, the, to help offset that disparity, right? That's one way, and in, in, in many ways, these workers are, are from the communities in which you're buying up property. So what would it mean to offer housing to those people that worked here as a way to offset a lack of salary costs? That's one way. Um, you know, uh, to expand, so if, if they have children, expanding the free tuition benefits to staff and not just faculty, which doesn't, to be honest, doesn't really cost the university that much money. But they, 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 they monetize it based on what the normal value of this would be to an outside figure, but the actual person sitting in the room does not add much of additional cost to that classroom space. So there are ways in which the university can do this in relatively cheap ways that they, they refuse to do so. And I, to be honest, I think part of it is because we don't engage universities from this perspective as uh, a company, as a, uh, a city builder, as a urban steward. We still talk about them as uh, as providers of education, and that's it. So, yeah, thanks. Um, thank you so much for that really um, fascinating and inspiring talk. So I wanted to sort of ask an extension of Kevin's question about, you know, the business model. Yeah. Um, you know, we're at a public university where um, the state funding has, you know, dropped mm -hmm. to a very low level, and everything is about finding a new business model. Right. And we are doing exactly the same thing at UCSD that you're describing. Mm -hmm. we're building, I saw it yesterday. Right, we're building new housing that's mm -hmm. going to be market love, you know, right. market rate, and mm -hmm. we're going to bring, you know, uh, businesses on campus um, that they're going to make money from. So all of this is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the explanation is that we don't have the state funding that right. we used to, and we have to create a new business business model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how how much of this, you know, how much of the solution would be, um, you know. Would, be, would have to be that sort of external state funding, and how much of it do you see as decisions that could actually be made sort of internally, yeah. you know, within the budget 
that the universities have now. I mean, is is the Canadian situation mm -hmm. different? You know, is there is there state funding? There model? are some state differences, but the, the shrinking budget for for them because it's relative. So, uh, in certain ways, education in Canada was relatively free, like it had been here in the seventies, um, and so they are still getting more state benefits than we are, but relatively speaking, they they are in, in, in enduring the same kind of budget deficit or bud the, the shrink in budget contributions. So one thing about this kind of, they, they have a nonprofit development corporation that builds that housing. Um, that's doable anywhere. It's just a matter if you want to offer a profit or nonprofit model. Uh, so it's just, I think some of it's a matter of priorities. Um, as well, if you're going to bring, say, biotech or med research on campus, then don't play the shell game and try to keep that pro those properties um, designated as research facilities that allows them to remain tax exempt. Um, there will have to be some public lobbying to say, okay, we need to see the books. But there can be some internal things. I mean, for example, with the firing of Aramark and creating, creating diversity foods, that's something that can be done internally and it, makes, it actually makes uh, food costs cheaper and more, and more healthy, more sustainable. Um, a lot of these things can be done into, in, uh, internally. This is a matter of economic and uh, uh, creative uh, courage to do so, and an honesty about the fact that this is not the new normal, just simply as a way to shore up the loss from the state. This is the new normal also as a way to produce profits. And so if you're going to be a non-profit institution, come in at the end of the fiscal year level, not millions of dollars in profits. I mean, one nefarious thing that was happening at NYU is that the Board of Trustees had a number of individuals who were owners of um, uh, lending institutions that were being used by the students. So in exchange, it's not, it's not direct, but we see the end result was that in exchange for Board Trustees trustee membership, you then had a captive market for selling your financial services to students on campus. These arrangements need to be brought to light. Because it's not just about producing profit for the university, it's about outside private institutions using the university as a shelter. Right? So that's important, we need to address that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It's a thank you. lot of very important information. Thank you. Uh, it seems to me most of the example you give have been giving is relatively you, you, elite universities that are exploiting the hmm. situation. Okay. Right? Ch you know, Chicago, Columbia, right. Right. and NYU. so forth. And I, I'm wondering whether the less elite universities mm -hmm. have a better record at this. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm particularly thinking of like, like a university like Virginia Commonwealth. Okay. Virginia Commonwealth was created because they didn't want the quote riffraff into University of Virginia. University of Virginia. Right? Yep. So it was created in the sense of serve kind of a middle class and lower class people. Right, right. So a, a, a university of that type, mm -hmm. because of their own creation and their own population, right. are they a little bit more conscious of this and less right. exploited? Well, good question. Um, actually, VCU in Richmond. Um, they have been notorious historically for upholding gentrification or, or kind of uh, uh, racial separation, residence segregation. Um, so they are, I'm, I'm, it's funny you mentioned them. Uh, <laughs> they, schools like that, even historically black colleges like Howard University, um, have been engaging in this process. So it's sometimes it's not, just, it's not a matter of the, the mission of the university, it's the capital. So the, the difference might be they don't have the same capacity to engage in these practices. I mean, one of the biggest, um, most notorious exploiters, and I have a whole chapter on them in the book, in progress, of this kind of practices, is Arizona State University, the biggest university in the country with over 60,000 students. They are creating not just little pockets of biomedtech, they're creating whole innovation districts that are tax exempt because of Arizona law. Any land owned by the Arizona Board of Regents is tax exempt. So they have like insurance companies and research facilities and uh, like, like straight up for profit institutions on their properties that because it's an ABOR land, it's tax exempt. 
So cities like Tempe, Arizona, are near bankruptcy, are struggling with inflated housing costs because so much of their properties are university or border regions controlled. So they're going hat in hand to beg them to pay something on their taxes. But you know Arizona, the real estate capital of the world, they're like, this is my land, don't tread on me. Um, I can do what I want on my land, I'm not paying taxes. And to the point where uh, Michael Crow, the press, I got to sit down with him for like two hours. Um, and sometimes people of power, you think, oh, they won't talk to me, they know what I'm about. But sometimes they have so much hubris, they tell me, they tell you exactly what they're doing. Right? So he's like, yeah, we're using these tax shelters, this, you know, this, this, the, the, the capacity of being tax exempt to help pay for our um, a, a renovation of our football stadium, giving us the chance to, um, before he was the former coach of the New York Jets, actually I think he's African American, um, to pay for a $6 million uh, uh, salary. It's, it's the buying up of these properties and putting them under the jurisdiction of, of the uh, Board of Regents and then putting for-profit in institutions on these spaces is allowing us to underwrite all the other things that we want because at the end of the day, some of it is not just straight nonprofit. It's about creating an environment, as I said before, that will attract the top researchers and their families so that their research can, can be brought to market. So we want to create an environment of museums and coffee shops and facilities and lectures and concerts, et cetera, so that they will come here and not go to Harvard. So that then the research they produce will hopefully get patents that we get 60% of and, as a university, and it will go to market, and that will be the way we can generate revenue. And so um, you definitely see less of this at the smaller schools and you see less of this at schools that don't have graduate studies in science and uh, uh, medicine. Because they're more easily brought to market, the research is more easily brought to market, or engineering. So Carnegie Mellon is notorious for this project, these kind of work, work as well. So yeah, I think those, those are the differences that you see in terms of, in terms of scale. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? You just mentioned football at, at ASU. Right. Can you just say something about the relationship of sports to all of this? Because, yeah. I mean, that is not one of our particular problems right. here, but mm -hmm. we, yeah. yet, yeah. Yet. Yeah. Right. yet, yeah. but we know how, how important that is in so many, many places. places, and it's a way of attracting alums mm -hmm. and alums' and money dollars. and all yep. that stuff. If you could just yep. say something about that. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. I was just talking to Nancy yesterday about the fact that I've been doing this work. That is one area that I have avoided mm -hmm. because of all the minefields that come with it, but it is definitely a critical piece in this larger story that needs, I don't think I have necessarily talk about it, but I think it has to be incorporated into this pro, into this kind of thinking. Uh, I think to the degree to which I'm discussing Arizona State is the degree to which I'm gonna talk about it, but there's no question that sports stadiums and the salaries for their high paid uh, coaching staffs are a part of this university um, business model and the building of stadiums in central cities or in the periphery is a part of this model or more easily more importantly the sports complex is a way to help generate revenue as we see a loss in state expenditures uh, for universities um, in the ways that we see with real estate and um, um, uh, medical research and bio research so there's no questions a part of the story yeah thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the description of uh, what's going on in Arizona State yeah a particularly egregious example, mm -hmm. uh, it struck me that uh, th that sort of activity would be a target of opportunity for all sorts of interests to pursue law lawsuits, for example, okay. to get that to get those issues s sorted out yes. so that the, the shelter aspect, mm -hmm. the, the, I don't call it fraudulent shelter, but the improper sheltering yeah. of for-profit enterprises mm -hmm. could be attra attacked. Has there been significant law? Lawsuits brought to try and yes. segregate, separate out the, the true educational profit. versus yeah, the that's right. private interest. Yes, so I gave the example of Princeton where, where they won, but some of it is like you got to remember that a lot of these private, not private and public uh, urban kind of universities are where? They're in low income neighborhoods of color. And so it took a lot of political will to generate support for a, for a legal team 
that supported this case with Princeton. And that's what would have to happen because every state has different tax laws or different real estate laws. And so it's a, so in the time in between this practice going on and the ability to mount a defense or an attack, you have decades of capital accumulation on the part of these universities. On top of the fact that we just simply don't have the conceptual headspace to see this as being an issue that is a private industry issue versus a higher ed issue. So they, they have to be done, but I'm just saying it takes time and money and political will, you know. Where, where are the tax authorities? Where are the feds? Yeah. Where's the IRS? Right. No, you're right. They're turn, many of them are turning their back, their heads, because this is higher education. It's, it's only now that we're facing kind of economic struggles in the national economy that people, and they're, they're attacking universities based on things like, well, the, we're going to look at the top elite universities. They, Congress, like three years ago, had a, had a hearing where the top universities came and had to get their hands slapped for their multi-million dollar endowments. And part of that was kind of a, a, a right-wing attack on higher education in general. And so it wasn't for the, it was, it was more for a public shaming. It wasn't for really understanding the infrastructure about how universities work. They had the public shaming moment, and then what happened? Universities wouldn't be doing business as usual, right? So it's, it's going to take, sure, po uh, political will, economic will, but it also, part of the part I'm trying to point out is that it's going to take um, a, a shift in imagination to understand the role that universities are playing in our urban economy and in our municipal governance. And that's something that, that the population at large has not come to yet. If it's simply a matter of we got bigger fish to fry, we're dealing with the wall, we're dealing with you know, uh, you know, international issues. But what I'm saying is that you know, whether we acknowledge it or not, this is a critical issue for the 21st century in terms of how cities, it's not just in terms of the economy, but in terms of like jurisdictional government. What does it mean for a private entity to have governance over public neighborhoods, right? in terms of policing, in terms of the valuation of land. So you're right, yes, this should all be happening. I'm trying to offer this work as a way to prick the awareness and the conscience of people to see that, how we, that, how, that we must engage universities in these ways, but at the same time without, without saying I'm trying to destroy universities. Okay. I believe in the university system or the higher ed system, but if, again, if they're going to play this kind of role, then they must do so transparently and deal with all of the kinds of responsibilities that come with this enlarged role in our cities. So I have a question about the meaning of all this for the status of liberal arts education. Mm. So if you think about it, I mean, there's one of Wendy yeah. Brown's book, The Undoing of the Demos mm -hmm. and the Neoliberal Stealth Revolution with mm -hmm. everything becoming commodified. What say you about civic imagination among students? Yeah. So we, I mean, like I said before, this kind of university corporation scholarship has dealt with some of this in terms of we see what happens when you start um, imposing a metric system on faculty publications and work, trying to make them more like a business model. We see this where you have um, university buildings that have private name, they, become, they get privatized like a stadium, and the responsibility that come with that. We see this in terms of curriculums actually being changed because of the donors um, on campuses, uh, more of a practical or, so we see the celebration right now of kind of a more practical education, more career-oriented education, but the, un, the consequences, the underside consequences is that the loss of, of a civic education. And I get it on one side saying, okay, students need to be prepared for the future, but people aren't looking at the nefarious underside of that whole practical model as being significantly driven by this economic vision of the university. It's not just about creating practically prepared students. It's about reimagining spaces and governance as private, as less democratic, as no longer decisions by consensus, decisions by dictate. Uh, that's, that's an intellectual shift that we need to be aware of. It's a beautiful part of what you're doing, but you're challenging us to think about understanding the protection of demos right. in the context of the rise of the 
of a materialist rock phenomena. There is a conceptual and a civic component as well. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, there is some interesting precedent. Uh, I know at Stanford and I know here, yeah. at the beginnings of the universities, the universities bought property for Jews mm -hmm. because yep. nobody would sell to Jews. Sure. And so it's kind of an interesting thing that's already happened mm -hmm. that people have forgotten now because yes. now it's good to be Jewish or right. whatever. Right, right, But uh, <laughs> I mean, you might tap into the precedent. Sure, in terms of like historical legacy. Like this, this is a part of your legacy as a university. You, you do have these kind of public good approaches to like land buying and not just the classroom and that we need to pull on these as, a, as something for the future. No question, that's a great point. Yeah. I don't. Land. Yeah. Yeah. Adult. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk and for this like really important work. Thank you. Um, so in the nineties, like urban planners and historians were talking about, you know, how American cities were more and more like theme parks. Mm -hmm. and, and I've been reminded of that work all over your talk. So for sure, like know, USC, like Hogwarts, Disneyland metaphor. Yes, for sure. and, and right here in San Diego, we're seeing like this uh, push from, you know, the universities to get like um, closer to shopping malls and mm -hmm. like shopping malls, like UDC mall providing housing, yeah. more affordable housing than the housing that we provide here right. for students. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this. For sure. Or play or nature. No, that's definitely a trend. So for example, one of my chapters on the University of Chicago, the key window into that discussion is the, um, it's, a, it's a horrible story where um, on the south side, in a historically black neighborhood, Bronzeville, there was a great um, kind of blues club called the Checkerboard Lounge. And um, what it was doing, it was, it was attracting students and faculty from Hyde Park up there to go and to be entertained. Well, as, as the University of Chicago stopped looking inward and started looking outward, they recognized people were calling Hyde Park the place where fun comes to die. They didn't have any entertainment. So their solution was not to build new entertainment, but since our students and faculty are already going to Checkerboard Lounge, what we're gonna do is buy it and move it to Hyde Park, right? And so the Checkerboard Lounge in Hyde Park became the anchor of what was called Harper Court, which was a reimagined commercial district um, that took two private streets and made them into a private alleyway with an LA Fitness, a Trader Joe's, no, sorry, Starbucks, a Trader Joe's, um, a Hyatt Mall, a Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Hotel on this private alleyway as kind of a playground for students and faculty and new residents. And so these kinds of developments you're seeing all over the USC Village, you, you know USC Village, Harper Court, um, this is happening at Yale, where previously working class commercial districts are being reimagined re into more high-end commercial districts for, um, as, as student playgrounds. So they all have an anthropology, they all have a, a, a Five Guys, they will all have the things that students recognize. And so you're seeing commercial life being repurposed and refocused re, uh, to, solely towards the interests of students and their families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we might have time for one last question if somebody wants to take it. In, in semi-private spaces, these spaces are also converted from being public to so kind of a, what I call open air enclosures, right? The, 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 the roads literally become private. Uh, regardless of the reality of it, do you think ideally universities would have all of the amenities that they do, like the concerts and the arcades and the restaurants and whatnot? Yes, I think that they would do have those things to some level, but uh, the the degree that they're having, I think the, the the difference is about is that those things, those amenities, are some of the very things that attracted non-students to these spaces. They, they, and they got reimagined as not university assets, but city assets, ways to distinguish uh, universities from other cities. And that imagining became a gateway into attracting public dollars 
into serving the non-public interests at universities. So all those amenities got reimagined as a way to generate capital and non-educational reasons. Well, sadly, that concludes our Q&A. Um, thank you all thank for you very coming. Much. Thank you. <laughs>